With Nepal's redrawing of the map to include a sliver of Indian territory, there's been much talk and debate about how much of the Chinese hand is involved in this. Because China, as you know, has been pushing uh, and pressing for its soft power influence across not only just its neighbors, but also in lands far away, like Africa and Latin America. So I'm going to speak about this today with Tushar Gupta. Tushar, give me your thoughts on this. Hi, Karan. Karan, yes, with what is uh, happening with Nepal, the diplomatic strains that have just come up, suddenly people are noticing China's big Mandarin push in the country. It's surprising because this is not something which just happened a couple of weeks ago, which preceded the events of what happened with the redrawing of the map. This was happening last year, and it's sort of shocking that India has woken up to this right now, that suddenly we are realizing the Chinese soft power push right at our doorstep in Nepal. Of course, there is no surprise about the kind of influence they hold in Pakistan due to the $60 billion CPEC that is the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So that influence is already there. But Nepal, which is all, almost a pole apart from what Pakistan is, and for China to have such a strong Mandarin push there is indeed a wake-up call for India. And we have also some lessons about the Mandarin push. It's just not about one language. So, of course, people have been learning about the events of Hong Kong and the kind of protests that have been going on there. When China started to attack the sovereignty of Hong Kong under the One Nation Two Systems uh, setup, they actually started with the cultural erosion. So firstly, they ensure that Mandarin was taught in every school and so on. So this entire process, starting with the, uh, you know, export of Mandarin language in country schools and everything, is actually a very smart, soft power push by China. And India should have woken up to this way earlier than it has now. Right. Tushar, now the soft power push is very evident with the neighbors. Now, for instance, you spoke about how they are paying for Mandarin to be taught in Nepal. Then there is obviously the BRI initiative. Uh, so it's very clear in, um, in the Asian uh, land. But what about beyond that? Where are we seeing China pressing for soft power influence? Karan, I'll give you some figures here to begin with. Okay, this might get a little long, but stay with me. Firstly, under the Belt and Road Initiative alone, China has $730 billion invested across the globe. Most of it is in Africa and East and West Asia, but $730 billion, that's just under the Belt and Road Initiative 1. Outside the Belt and Road Initiative, if we take Africa alone, there are investments worth $250 billion additionally. So that's somewhere in the neighborhood of $500 billion invested in Africa alone. And Africa, as we know, is a rich continent in terms of the minerals, in terms of the human resources. And China has been building up their you know, presence there for a very, very long time now. Now, that's just one example. This is the money part. Now, wherever the money follows, the soft push also follows. Now, we'll take the example of Mandarin, for instance. As you see more and more projects under the Belt and Road Initiative, under the Chinese investments in countries of Africa, South America, you will see people there having an incentive when it comes to learning Mandarin. Why people would be interested to learn Mandarin is not because somehow they find it appealing or somehow the language has a global reach. No, but because of the incentives that come along, somehow people feel that they will have a better shot at getting jobs under the Chinese projects in their country. So this is how the soft push is there. And this is something very recent which China has embarked on. Of course, after the Second World War, America exported its idea of democracy across the world and they exported their principles, their education system too. Much of it we have incorporated in India. But Chinese Communist Party in 2007, that was the first time really in the 17th National Congress, they came up with this entire idea of this soft power. And they've been spending around $10 billion every year making this push. For example, there's the Confucius Institutes, okay? They opened the first institute in 2004 in South Korea. Now, as of 2018, January, uh, according to the Council of Foreign Relations, there are 500 scattered institutes. So from one institute in 2004, they went to more than 500 in 2020. What do these institutes do? They're non-profit organizations affiliated with Chinese Ministry of Education. They provide Mandarin language courses, cooking and calligraphy classes, celebration for Chinese national holidays. So in a way, they're exporting that Chinese civilization mindset to countries of Africa, to South America, wherever Belt and Road Initiative is going. It partners with the local NGOs over there and, you know, it pays out the salaries and 
let's be honest in a country like africa where medicines are not there where teachers are not there this kind of a soft power push does yield results of course the western media has been averse to it for a very long time but just because the media doesn't see it it doesn't mean it doesn't exist china is putting its money where the future is and that is the big soft power push to give you one example apart from the export that happens of the civilizations also getting a lot of imports in 2017 alone china was the world's third third most popular destination for students with almost half a million students coming there from world over we already see the kind of uh, intimate relationship australia and china share when it comes to university students that's one way of soft power push India doesn't really have that. Of course, we are having students from Africa over, but if you go by the numbers, China's numbers are huge. Their investments for these soft power initiatives are huge. I'll give you another example since we are on it about the media. Now, what we saw in the wake of the COVID nineteen. Chinese media, Chinese state endorsed or state backed media, they actually went on a very elaborate news campaign across the globe where they. shifted the blame from china since they wanted the countries to focus on taking help from china which a lot of countries actually did now shinhua that is the government's primary news agency it has grown to 170 foreign bureaus it has planned to reach 200 foreign bureaus by 2020 china daily and global times we keep discussing about they are available worldwide in all the local languages right there is a uh, the cctv which is the state run broadcast network it is available in arabic french and you know all those other languages chinese radio international broadcasts around 392 hours of programming in 38 languages every day so imagine the kind of information outflow there is there and still somehow we are not uh, i mean we are still fixated on hey nepal got some primary schools teaching their mandarin but the mandarin is a very very small piece of this very large puzzle which is the soft power push Uh, Tushar, you have uh, very nicely elaborated on the many aspects of China's soft power push, but what is the motivation for it? Because it wasn't always there. I think it's it's uh, it's been seen more in this decade. Uh, what was the motivation for this deliberate push? See, when what happened after the Second World War, America made its influence felt in Europe through the Marshall Plan, where they aided countries who were trying to rebuild after the Second World War. They tried exporting the same model to Latin America. They started even with Cuba when that infamous uh, Bay of Pigs invasion and things like that happened. They tried different things because their agenda was that they wanted to contain the influence of the Soviet Union. Now that was a very different world, Karan. That was a world fresh out of a a very a sorrow world war and it was in the middle of a cold war today it's a very multilateral uh, you know setup in the entire globe china wants to counter the us world order rightfully because it sees itself as the next superpower they see the 21st century as their century with a receding role of the united states and that is where they're making the soft power push belt and road initiative is one example of that and they've been making this push in fact in hollywood of all places i remember a marvel movie i think it It was Iron Man three, where they in fact changed the entire plot so as to appease the Chinese audience. They did not want to anger the audience in China, even though the business that comes from there is not that significant. But even then. they changed the entire plot and this is disney i'm talking about disney is one of the biggest media companies of the united states and of the world they own hotstar in india so they even had to change their uh, storyline just to appease the chinese so imagine the kind of influence china already holds and this has a lot to do with challenging the us dominated world order we've already spoken at length about the way they've influenced the uh, institutions in the united nations we saw how who that is the world health organization they have been tip toeing you know around the chinese but they have not blamed them entirely for the covid-19 outbreak so you see the soft power push is just not about the language or the money it's across it's in entertainment it's in un institutions it's in how investments are being made and where us cannot make investments what has added to this is donald trump's a uh, focus on protectionism so the motivation has actually increased now because they are no longer countering a us led dominated order they are also having Donald Trump you know in a very uh, un presidented manner he also wants to receive the us's participation from the world order so this is the motivation to be the global leader the export of the chinese civilizational mindset is a part of being the world power they want to hold the influence 
in terms of soft power. That's what they want to do. And we'll see this very evidently in Africa. Right. Uh, Tushar, you touched upon this uh, aspect that US is sort of um, just sort of stepping away from its leadership role of the world. And we are seeing that in the wake of COVID-19, I think a lot of countries are going to be stepping back a bit and focusing on uh, healing the country's economy and stuff. Now, in this context, China is going to be making its push globally. So can you speak about the long-term implications of this happening? Of course, there are a lot of long uh, long-term implications and India must be mindful of many. So what the uh, Oval Office under Donald Trump was trying, it was trying to create an alliance against China, which we spoke about, the G11 alliance, right? They wanted India, Australia, South Korea to join in. They wanted Russia to come back. They wanted European Union to take arms against China, not uh, I mean, metaphorically speaking. But European Union has actually denied they want to thrive in a world where US and China work as systematic rivals. So no one really wants to take a side. So in that case, India needs to look at the implications where they'll have to counter China's soft power push firstly in the neighborhood. Of course, we cannot do anything about Pakistan because it's anyway on the financial, uh, you know, financial uh, dependency on China is too much. But we have to look at Nepal. We already saw what happened in Sri Lanka the debt trap that was set up. We have to look at states like Myanmar. We have to look at uh, other states in the region, especially in the Eastern Asia region. And we have to ensure that the implications do not hit us because India also makes a very huge soft power push. Let's be real. In the Eastern Asian countries, it makes for a soft power given the long-term civilizational ties we've held. But it's not going to matter in the long-term current. We cannot always sustain our diplomatic and cultural relations over the history of the last 2000 years. Of course, it's a great enabler, but India needs to look forward. China also had some very great civilizational relationship with countries of the past, which is the motivation for the Belt and Road Initiative, actually. But then they're also looking in the future. That's how it is. Right, Tushan, you can just finally sign off on this uh, last uh, aspect of why India must be mindful of these implications in particular. See, of course, because India at any time, it will be countering the Chinese influence. India and China at loggerheads. We saw the Ladakh standoff. And these are two superpowers of Asia. If US and China are two global superpowers going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, India and China will be two superpowers in Asia itself. And that is where the soft power push, understanding the soft power push is very important. We are going to trade with the nations of Africa. We are going to trade with the nations of Middle East. And that is where India needs to be mindful that they're not only countering a military China in the Northeast or in the dark sector, they're also countering a soft power influence of China. Our media channels are not up to the job. Our entertainment industry is not equipped to handle that kind of soft power influence. And that is why we should be more mindful about that. And that is why I insist that we should not just be fixated on the issue of the Mandarin language being taught in Nepal, but a lot more that the Chinese are doing because Africa for uh, trade is going to be as important to us as it is it's going to be for China. But it seems China is going to have a greater advantage there down the lane. Okay, thanks, Tushar.